Hey, you guys, welcome to the Meta Mind Shift Show. Uh, my name is Nicole. Uh, some people call me Technical, um, but you can call me the Metaverse Goddess. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I am very happy uh, to be with you guys today. This is our first show for the Meta Mind Shift Show. Um, we are here on the Black Business Network. Um, man, it is a great time to be here. We are definitely, uh, I am definitely excited uh, to be able to bring the show to you here on Pod TV, on uh, the Black Business Network, on YouTube, Roku, Hulu, LinkedIn, Spotify, and uh, many, many other places. Uh, so I, I just, I'm delighted. Uh, again, my name is Nicole Maxwell, and I am your guide to the metaverse. And so we are going to take a look at what the metaverse is. We're going to help you answer some questions. We're going to help you to alleviate some concerns that you might have about what's coming in the future. And so this show is going to take a look at all things metaverse. And so um, it's important for you to know that when I'm talking about the metaverse, most times I am talking about the decentralized metaverse because that's the one I hope we all get. Um, there are many different types of metaverses and people that talk about the metaverse in different ways. Um, but it is really important to know that there's different things out there. So every week we're going to come to you at on Tuesdays at 6 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, and I am going to help guide you into the metaverse. Now, why am I qualified to do that? Well, <laughs> one, because I've been in the metaverse for a very, very long time, it feels like. Um, I am, uh, right now, I am the CEO of Black Multiverse Enterprises. I am also uh, the founder of Blackverse, the metaverse community, or a metaverse community. I am also the owner of Technical Consulting, which is an organization that helps you to be a little bit more technically savvy in the metaverse. But all of those things are, are dedicated to helping individuals make their way to the metaverse. And in Web3 terminology, that is called onboarding. So I help you to take a trip uh, to uh, the other side. And so um, that's what we're going to be discovering is what is the metaverse? What can the metaverse be? Uh, the first rule of the metaverse. Uh, let me finish up. Uh, so <laughs> what else about me uh, makes this uh, a cool show to watch? And what else about me makes me, you know, kind of uh, in a good position to be your guide? Um, so first of all, uh, I am a sci-fi fan. Uh, I have been a sci-fi fan since I was probably like three or four. Um, I used to watch Star Trek when I was little. I loved um, um just black and white movies and, and movies that took a, a different look on the future. Uh, Twilight Zone was one of my favorite shows ever. Uh, and I'm talking about the original. I'm an Alfred Hitchcock fan. Uh, definitely uh, a fan of the newer things like Black Mirror and uh, Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy and all sorts of movies in between. Um, I am definitely a movie fan, so uh, that is not to be understated. Um, and I'm also a gamer. And so uh, those things are the ways that I've had fun traditionally throughout my life. Uh, I am a gamer from way back. Uh, you guys may have caught me on the Gamer's Den uh, last week, um, but we talked a little bit about what that looked like when I was younger. I uh, used to have quite a bit of fun uh, gaming um, all throughout life, and then I became an adult and things got boring. Um, but I went back to gaming to help me to stop working so much. So uh, it was really cool uh, to be able to do that. So um, I uh, definitely um, was uh, very happy to be able to, um, to just bring back gaming as a way to um, reduce my workload and take off uh, a little bit of stress. But anyway, um, in trade, uh, by, by trade, um, I am an implementation consultant. And so what that means is that I have historically had 
um, the responsibility of taking decentralized organizations and centralizing them. And so what that means is that you have an organization um, that has all these different uh, field offices or uh, think about a, potentially a franchise or somewhere with a lot of branches like a bank. And that organization, so the parent company or um, the, uh, in, the enterprise organization, wants to bring everybody in house and they get tired of everybody having their own way of doing things because it makes it hard on the corporate entity. So they, you know, reach out to professionals, me, and uh, they have us to go out and we um, kind of connect with the satellite offices or the uh, decentralized field offices and we understand and um, begin to do what's called an as-is process. Uh, we take a deep dive into how you're doing things right now. And then we take that and we used to uh, re-engineer it. That's what it's called. It's a process re-engineering. And so we would take your, um, your processes for like AP, for invoice receipt, for bill payments, for... Um, corporate anything. So any of you think about any, any process um, within the corporation, uh, we took that process and then streamlined it. So that means that the process changed. And what ultimately happened was that the decentralized field office had to straighten up and they had to do things the way that the big organization or the entity or the enterprise uh, rolled out. Uh, so they had to do that new process and use those new systems and those things that were um, impacting to um, to every. So it was it was forcing kind of that um, small corporate model to use the model of the big guys. And so sometimes that worked out fine. If we did our jobs right, it worked out just fine. But a lot of times there were individual hardships where people had a really hard time because people don't like change. And so we would have people who revolted or, um, you know, uh, would try to do certain things to manipulate the process and make us uh, look like we were doing the wrong thing when we were trying to streamline these things. And so I say all that to say, that's my history is, is being able to understand what I called chaos back then and turn it into uh, something that was um, that was not chaos, and so something that was pretty beautiful and worked and flowed and uh, worked really, really well. Except all those individuals who used to use their old processes had to start using the new ones, and they had to conform to the corporate model. Why am I telling you all that? We're talking about the metaverse. Well. Um, at some point last year, and I know when that point was, uh, I became very serious about decentralization. Um, and the reason for that is because Facebook came out and they said, hey, we are going to present, we, they presented the metaverse to the world and said, we are building the metaverse and kind of laid down the gauntlet. And a lot of people understood only Facebook's way of doing things and they only understood the metaverse according to Facebook. But people in my camp, we had been talking about the metaverse for months, for almost a year at the time. And it had become apparent that we were not talking about the same things. So while one entity was saying we're going to tell you what this thing is and we're building it and you're going to come. Other people were saying, hey, let's build this together and let's build a world that looks good and is fun and is uh, incorporating all these technologies where you get to be free and decentralized. And it became really, really apparent to me that that's the one that I wanted people to understand was an alternative. That's the one that I want to ensure that people know exists. And so while we have all of these different options, options are a great thing. So the future of the metaverse 
is the future of the internet. So you understand the internet now, you understand a space where you are uh, utilizing your web browser and your web browser takes you to a place. You may not understand like everything that's happening underneath that, but you know that you type in google.com and it takes you to a search engine. And that search engine can open up doors for you that you never understood were even out there. And those are web pages. In the future, that's not gonna change in the way that you do that necessarily. What will be changing is how you're experiencing that, that site or what that, that page, right? That experience. The metaverse is an experience. I finally heard somebody else say this uh, last week and uh, I was delighted. Um, so the metaverse is an experience where you are able to not only have this futuristic technology working under the hood, but you're also able to get up and walk around inside of your internet as your avatar or represented by your avatar. You are able to, instead of scrolling up and down and swiping left and right, uh, you're going to be able to actually walk or fly <laughs> or float <laughs> through a store or through an experience and uh, maybe it's a guitar shop or maybe it's a coffee shop or maybe it's um, and maybe it's, you know, a, a fashion warehouse, but you're able to literally be there represented by your avatar. And so it's 3D. And that's what's really, really cool about it is that it's a 3D experience generally. Um, that experience is going to allow you to engage with other people. And some people might say, well, hey, I can do that now. I have chat. Well, <laughs> you're going to have chat too. <laughs> That's not going away. We're still going to have to talk to each other. Uh, but you are going to be able to um, engage with thousands of people. And when I say thousands, we're talking to the tune of 50,000 at a time or more. Right now, not so much. Right now, you can probably get up to 50 people in a space if you're lucky. Um, and if you're super lucky, you understand what sharding is and you can have multiple spaces that are stacked of stacks of 50 people in a space that makes it all feel like you're all together, but you're really not. Uh, so the future of the Internet is interconnected. I gave the example the other day where uh, you are in your living room. So you understand interconnectivity right now because you have Wi-Fi, right? So your Wi-Fi router connects your home. Uh, well, think about the metaverse as a way to connect everything. And so not only will your home and your TVs and your, your Google Home hubs and your, your uh, phones and, and tablets and devices and all of those things be connected, but so will the school down the block and the, um, the corporation down the block and the restaurants down the block as well as all the folks in another state, as well as all the people over in Paris and the people over in Morocco, you will be able to be interconnected in the same way that you can now click on a browser link and go. Your avatar will be able to port from one place to another. And so there is interconnectivity and interactivity. And those two things are making up the experience of the metaverse. The technology that the metaverse is built on, there's a lot. <laughs> the technology, when we're talking about the decentralized metaverse, it starts with the blockchain. The blockchain. Uh, the blockchain enables and empowers decentralization. So we'll talk about decentralization in a minute. Um, but um, one of the great things um, about the future is Web3. And so Web3 is decentralization in terms of technology. So right now you have an understanding of technology. And most times when you think about technology, your brain goes to one of five places. And that is Google, Facebook, Netflix, Amazon, Apple, and Microsoft, your fang companies. And so those companies own so much of us. They own so much of our data. Uh, and it is, it is, it is not fair, <laughs> quite frankly, because they are profiting off of us. 
I'm putting things out right now. I am being broadcast on many, many, many different networks and I am putting out my content into this world. But what's happening is some of these networks have um, access to the data behind the scenes. And so they take that data, they take your clicks and your points and your, your oh so long little holds over uh, or mouse overs on certain ads and they compile that data in the back end engines and then they sell it. And so data is a very large commodity. It was, and I'm pretty sure it still is, uh, the largest commodity that is traded uh, right now. In 2020, it was the largest commodity that was traded. That's saying a lot because we have a lot of different commodities out here. And so when data became the largest traded commodity, it was like, wait a minute. I produce data. I'm the one who's creating that data. But I'm not getting paid for that. We just saw this happen um, in real time. Uh, Mr. Musk, Elon Musk, was going to purchase Twitter. And he laid down a price of $44 billion. And Twitter said, okay, <laughs> let's do this. Um, and so what he was buying is our data. He was buying all the users. He was buying all the group lists. He was buying all the tweets and all the chats and all the DMs and all of the Twitter spaces, um, voice data and recordings and all of these private communities. He was buying all that data. And so he got that data, got his hands on it, uh, went looking through it and then said, nah, I'm good. I'm not going to buy it right now. <laughs> but when he said he was going to buy it, we were not getting any of that. Now, I produced that. You probably produced that. Anybody who was on Twitter produced that. And two things did not happen. One, I didn't get a dime. Nobody did because the transaction didn't go through. But at the time, I was not planning to receive any money from that transaction. So some um, stockholders would have received funds from that. But unless you were holding stock, you got nothing. And that's your data. That's my data. That's transacting. In addition to that, um, nobody asked me. Nobody asked me, nobody came to me and said, hey, Nicole, do you want, uh, are you cool with us selling to Elon? We're going to sell all your data. You good? Nobody asked me that. And so why am I telling you this story? Well, <laughs> because that is what decentralization is. It is taking away the power of these big companies to transact our data. And so we decentralize the idea of a big company owning a single data repository or being the only actors in the data transaction. So I, in the future, will be able to own my data and I will be able to transact my data and I will be able to hire, this is my goal anyway, I will be able to hire a data analyst who can take a look at all of my data and say, hey, you should be doing this, 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 and this, and making affiliations with these people because they're going to be the ones who are going to pay you back the most. And so that is decentralization. It removes a central entity or central, uh, in some instances, a central authority for one thing. And so decentralization exists in many different spaces. And so a lot of times people just focus on technology. And so they focus on the fact that the blockchain is decentralized and the blockchain decentralizes uh, the server, uh, the server um, schema, right? So you have a centralized server in most technology. The blockchain takes that and distributes it to other nodes. So every node in the blockchain system, it's a chain of nodes. Those chains each have a copy of what that central server would have. And what that enables and empowers is you to have, um, you to have more copies. So it's redundancy at its best, right? Um, but it also does a couple of other things and it, it, it creates a transaction log or what we call a ledger. 
And so if you are into tech, then you may understand that this is not a new concept. Ledgers have been around forever, not only in banking, but also in technology. And so in technology, it's usually called a, um, a, a log. So there's a log, a, uh, audit log, a transaction history log. And so that is a log of every single event that has happened on a database. Well, what happens is um, someone has to create that set of parameters. And so if they don't say that you need to watch this field uh, for changes, then someone could go in and make changes to that field and no one ever know that it's been changed because it wasn't being watched in the first place. So you're only as good as the start. Uh, whereas with blockchain, um, the transaction log is there. It's publicly available, meaning you don't have to ask for access to go do some research on some things that are happening in this world. You don't have to ask for um, for permission because you are granted by permission by being an actor within the space. So those are some great things. We're going to definitely dive all the way into the blockchain decentralization uh, technology of the future. Um, and so that's really where I want to go now is technology of the future. What does that look like? So the technology that's building the metaverse. We talked about blockchain. We talked about Web3. So blockchain technology coupled with Web3 is decentralization. And it enables and empowers us to do a couple of really cool things that are happening right now. One, you have cryptocurrency. Cryptocurrency takes the place of uh, the currency that you know uh, today. So if you're in the U.S., it takes the place of your U.S. dollars. Um, it is a digital coin or a digital form of um of finance, right? So uh, you were able to see all the transactions because it lives on the blockchain. There is a lot of reasons to have cryptocurrency, and I'm so excited to announce that Naja Roberts will be coming to the MetaMind Shift Show on August 16th. So you guys mark your calendars. Um, and so she's going to explain the history of money to us, as well as why cryptocurrency makes sense for us as a people and also uh, for, you know, pretty much everybody, uh, unless you're a banker, <laughs> uh, then you probably have a great use for uh, cryptocurrency. And even then, uh, we are seeing banks adopt cryptocurrency as well. And so um, it's going to be really important for us to glean what is true decentralization, what is true cryptocurrency versus a watered down version that doesn't really give us the ownership that we want uh, with decentralization. Um, the other types of things that are out there, so uh, decentralization um, and Web3, take a, 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 not a stab, they, they decentralize um, what we historically know to be true. So right now, we are used to corporations and these corporations have hierarchies. And so you may be a low-level employee. And that means that above you, <laughs> you have your, your supervisor, your manager, their director. You probably have a senior director over the director's director's director and probably like four or five other directors on top of that. Plus, you probably have a VP and then a senior VP and then a C-level and then the CEO. Like That's usually how it works, right? Uh, in addition to the CEO, you probably have a board or two uh, or three or four or five. Well, that's what we call a hierarchy. It's high because you have to climb that ladder to get all the way up there. And most people start at the bottom. For our communities, um, it is really tough on us because, one, we're not starting necessarily on the same even playing field. So we have a lot of systemic issues that are that are impacting us as a community. And so life forces us to start here instead of starting here most times or in a lot of instances. And so what we have an opportunity right now to do is to 
level things off a little bit. So right now we have the opportunity to disrupt uh, what is currently known as um, your corporate structure. In Web3, we have the idea and the concept of a DAO. A DAO is a decentralized autonomous organization. That is an organization that functions with the help of a blockchain. And so the people in that organization are typically flat. And so everybody, there is no real reporting structure in that way. You might have the founders who put forth the effort to start the initiative, um, but then you have all of the community that helps to drive that initiative forward. So if we were going to say that today in MetaMindShift, we wanted to start a DAO and that DAO was going to be dedicated to uh, feeding goats for a week or every month, uh, we could do that. And um, we would start up a DAO. Uh, lots of times you can register that DAO out in Wyoming. And then we would come together and create what's called a smart contract. And that contract would guide us as we go forward. So it would help us to understand um, things like the uh, voting structure. Um, it would help us to understand what happens when someone buys up too much of X, Y, and Z product or something like that. Uh, we would define all the rules and parameters for the DAO itself. Uh, and that they would all be guided by, or handled and maintained by the smart contract. And so the smart contract um, is technology that sits on top of the blockchain and it enables and empowers decisions to be made. So right now, if you want decisions to be made in a corporate structure, you go through and you have a vote with your board and there's a lot of scheming and wheeling and dealing that happens and then something uh, happens. So either it goes through or it doesn't. Uh, in this new way of doing things, you have a smart contract and that smart contract helps you to vote. And so it captures your vote for you as an individual contributor to the process. That's empowerment because you're no longer subject to the whims of everybody else. Your vote matters. Your vote counts and your vote is counted by the technology. And then once those votes are tallied, that's how the decision gets made. And there's usually not another way for someone to come in and, and talk their way through uh, making that change because the community has voiced its opinion. And then that's how actions are done. We saw people try to actually purchase uh, a copy of the Constitution um, over the fall or winter uh, of last year, so around January. Uh, that is, I think, when that happened. <laughs> Time moves different in the space, so uh, forgive me for that. But <clears throat> that is another thing that is happening in the space. In addition to that, we have um, what a lot of you probably have heard of, NFTs. <sighs> NFTs, non-fungible tokens. So non-fungible tokens are digital assets. So you have a picture um, that you love and appreciate that may be digital art created by someone that can be um, a membership to something uh, represented by a piece of artwork or a card. Uh, it can be um, a placeholder for a memory or it can be a picture that you've uploaded or, you know, some silly piece of art that you're using as what we call a PFP. And that is your profile picture. So you have that kind of thing. Um, also, NFTs are changing the game for literally everything. And so there are so many use cases for NFTs. We are going to dive into all of those. So stay tuned. Uh, not now, but over the course of the next few weeks, we will be diving into uh, the history of NFTs as well as the future of NFTs. So everything from fashion to, um, to what I say earlier, goats, uh, to memberships and um, really cool use cases for NFTs 
things are becoming NFTs. Like we've seen people take pictures of garbage and make them NFTs and they sell for ridiculously large amounts of money. We've seen people uh, take pictures or take capture um, first time events, such as a first time tweet uh, and sell it for millions of dollars. Like things like that are happening in this space and it's happening right underneath our noses. And so if you're not aware of what's going on in this space, if you're not aware of the terms to look to think about, you're missing out. And that's the one thing I don't want for anybody. Like we are not having a whole community of people miss out on the reshaping of this world because first of all, our opinions matter. Uh, we matter. We have got too much at stake to sit back and let this time happen without us. So I'm on a mission to make sure that we all understand what is at stake when we talk about the future and the history and the future of the metaverse, okay? Um, in addition to that, there's something called virtual land. And virtual land is transacted as an NFT. That NFT gives you a space in a metaverse. It gives you a place to call your very own. And so you are able to take that virtual land and build whatever you want to on it, uh, according to the platform that it's on. But the great thing about that is that it is minted onto the blockchain. And so the ownership there is something that cannot be altered. Um, it is cemented into the blockchain. That means you have that NFT of your purchase and no one can take it from you, literally. <laughs> and so, unless you give it to them. Um, and so it is, it's empowering in so many different ways. I own plots of land. I own, um, I own spaces and places and I create spaces and places for other people. Uh, I, I, you know, kind of take a look at different metaverses as they're coming up. And uh, we're going to be jumping into a lot of them. We're going to be looking at a lot of them to uh, kind of determine like, what is this? And what is it really? Is it just an NFT? Is this more crypto based? Or is it something that is uh, truly a metaverse uh, that we can get in an experience? You will be able to experience the metaverse in many different ways. And so a lot of that is some of that is on the browser, right? Quite a bit of it is on the browser. Uh, some of it, though, a lot of it, is experienced in what we call virtual reality. And so, yep, we're going to be going on trips <laughs> into virtual reality. I will have on my headset and I will be taking you along with me because we are going to discover the metaverse together. Uh, I am also going to be showing you or trying to introduce you to AR, and that is augmented reality. What does it look like when you take technology and pull it into your living room using your phone or some other piece of tech uh, that's out here? Things are moving really, really fast. And so it's important to know that you have a resource you can go to to help you understand what's coming. I am that resource, I am your guide. I am your guide to the future and your guide to the metaverse. And I am so excited to be able to, to help you to discover it, to discover a plan for yourself, for your family and for your business as you think about the future in the metaverse. I want everybody to just do me a quick favor. Close your eyes. Think about a time when you were a kid and you used to have so much fun. For me, that was in gaming, but for you, it might have been playing softball or soccer uh, or football. It could have been playing outside in the snow or going to the lake or jump diving off of a uh, diving board into a pool Anything that you did when you were younger, imagine that. Now take that imagination and put it in your favorite place. 
whether that's Morocco or Paris or somewhere else, <laughs> maybe that's in Antarctica or, uh, or uh, you know, in New York. Take that experience and put it there. And then imagine you having fun with all the people you actually want to, regardless of where they are. So if they are in another state and you can't do that with them right now, or if they are in another country and you are just so far away, the metaverse is going to be your portal to have fun with them and access them like no other way. Yes, you can video chat right now. Yes, you can. Um, you can, uh, you know, play a couple of games together. But this is different. This is different. And I'm going to show you why. Um, I'm going to take you into what it's like to work in the metaverse. I want you to imagine things that are not possible right now being possible because of technology. Technology is changing the way and the potential for everything that we have right now. And so, yes, we are going to take a look at what it's like to work in the metaverse. Uh, I was able to come on to a uh, conference uh, a couple months ago and show people uh, what it was like to appear in a conference, just like you see me now, except I was an avatar. And so I was literally hanging out in the stream. And I did that because uh, someone else actually um, did that with me. And I thought it was the funnest thing. And it's just so cool. And, you know, right now it's very, very cool because nobody's doing it. But in the future, uh, when you see me, I might not feel like putting on makeup or I might not feel like looking cute uh, to get on screen. So I'm going to show up as my avatar. And you're going to be able to hang out with my avatar. <laughs> And so that's what the future has in store for us is being able to be represented by our digital twin or twins. So how many avatars do you have? If you're looking at my screen right now, you see a couple of mine. My girls are going to be with me uh, anytime we're, we're exploring the metaverse. So one of them will show up and show out with me. Um, but they'll always be here on screen just as a reminder that it's not just me. Like I'm not here alone. Uh, I'm used to having an avatar in gaming. Uh, so this is not a new concept for me. But for many of you, this is a new idea. You're not used to um, seeing people and not knowing their name, their background, or, you know, what they really look like in re the real world. So those are definitely different things that you're going to be able to experience through the MetaMind shift. And so I am a fan of thinking big and thinking large and thinking grand when you think about the metaverse. For some folks, you're going to want to just rebuild your real life and put it in a virtual space and that's enough. And so that makes you happy. But for a lot of other folks, they are out here and they are building and they are just doing things that are extraordinary. And that is what the meta mind shift is, is taking your mind and shifting it so that you understand that you're no longer limited by four walls that surround you on a daily basis. You are able to think exponentially and experience exponentially. And man, when we get to haptics, oh, that's a whole other thing. So I am really, really excited um, to be able to bring this, this production to you. Um, I am grateful uh, for those of you who are here. Thank you for uh, doing that little activity with me. And I want to just really quickly show you like what's happening in the world today. So um, we talked about crypto. And one of the news stories that hit uh, a couple days ago is that the SEC is actually, um, they are filing charges uh, against 11 people for conspiring in a crypto pyramid scheme that, uh, that duped <laughs> about $300 million from its investors. $300 million. And when I tell you that's not even a lot when we're talking about this space, it's not. 
that kind of money floats through the space on the daily. Um, and the reason I'm telling you that is because, again, it's important that when you are beginning to act in the space, you understand that there are bad actors. Just like in real life, you can get robbed or you can get mugged in this space, in the virtual space, when you're dabbling in Web3 and you don't know what you're doing, even when you do know what you're doing, there are people out here who can dupe you. So it's very important. It's imperative that you have somebody at your disposal to help you. And I'm happy to be that person. <laughs> um, so I want to um, go on to our next story. Decentraland is a metaverse uh, that we are going to hang out in quite a bit, or at least a little bit. Um, and Decentraland announced the world's very first ATM. What? There's an ATM in the metaverse. Now, I don't even want to know why um, <laughs> this is a thing, because we are supposed to be talking about crypto. Uh, but um, Decentraland uses crypto. It is a decentralized space, and they are appearing to be able to allow people to utilize the ATM to withdraw mana, which is their cryptocurrency. So that is, uh, that's pretty cool. Um, although they have their wallets uh, attached, I'm not really sure why they need uh, the ATM, but that's all right. Uh, another story that's going on um, is that uh, tequila is jumping into the metaverse. Uh, they are jumping in with a summer sensational Patron pop-up. So if you like tequila, you like some Patron, there's going to be a Patron in the Central Land uh, here in August. So uh, take a look in your uh, news so you can check that out. Um, the global metaverse in fashion market is predicted to grow, now listen to this, by $6.6 .6 billion from 2022 to 2026, escalating at 36.47% during this period. So um, fashion is a thing. My avatars right there, they look cute because I dressed them that way. Like my avatars, uh, I, I cannot tell you how fun it is to actually get like your good avatar uh, that looks and feels like you, that you want to represent you like everywhere and like like actually do that. The one on the end with the glasses, uh, she is she's that one for me. I love her, um, but uh, she's newer to my collection, but it's a definitely a thing. Like you want to be able to dress up your avatar. So we're going to be talking to people who are actually out here making fashion NFTs. Uh, I have a girl named Koss, Koss and she uh, has a business named Koss Couture. And she actually creates NFT jackets. But the thing about these jackets is they're what we call fidgetals. And so those fidgetals, uh, while you do get the NFT, you also get the physical form of the jacket. So uh, she has a really cool line and I cannot wait uh, till she comes on and she can show you kind of what she's building, what she's doing. Um, and so, you know, we have a lot of different things that are happening in the metaverse. Um, the metaverse is predicted to surpass uh, 50 billion by 20. 26 in terms of market share. Uh, that is insane and awesome all at the same time. Uh, there are jobs in the metaverse. So um, six jobs that are going to boom as the tech companies uh, build out the metaverse. Um, there are a lot of them here. One, 3D artists, of course. 3D artists. Yeah, of course, 3D artists. We got to have our 3D artists because they're creating all of this beautiful artwork for us. Uh, UX and UI designers. Experience is key in the metaverse. So user interfaces and U um, user uh, experience designers are going to be uh, the cream of the crop when it comes to uh, building out these spaces. VR and AR. Man, if you know VR and AR, your AR being augmented reality and VR being virtual reality, you are going to be able to steer uh, the future. And so we are looking at, uh, when I'm going through this list of jobs, like this is where our kids need to be. Um, 
we are also looking at software engineers and developers because software engineers and developers are going to develop the code uh, that creates that the that the three D uh, world creators are able to build on. So uh, that is that is awesome. Um, then also we have AI, so artificial intelligence. Artificial intelligence is a way for our technology to learn and to be a little bit smarter and do things a little bit more efficiently than it does now. Additionally, um, you don't have to be in tech. A lot of these other jobs out here, uh, including architects and interior designers, fashion designers, storytellers, writers, all of these people are already here in the metaverse. When we're thinking about musicians and artists, they're making space in the metaverse. I had the opportunity to interview Russell Simmons last year, uh, along with Naja Roberts, or host the interview uh, with Naja Roberts, uh, where she interviewed Russell Simmons. But to be able to, to do that and to hear and talk to him about um, why he felt like it was important to have um, a NFT collection for the masterminds of hip hop, the legends of hip hop. He did that because he knew and understood what this space had to offer. He did that because he knew that our history gets rewritten too many times. And this space is a way for us to accurately capture it and put it out here um, for the world to see for years and, and eons to come. So there are uh, all sorts of jobs out here. So don't, don't uh, fret about that. Um, change is good in this instance uh, because we are able to do some really cool things with the change that is coming. One of them I'm actually going to show you right now uh, before we wrap up. And that is going to be uh, this one because it's really, really cool and it's brand new. And I want to be able to show you this. Uh, but this headline is, High Street redefines the metaverse via home sales and Anamoka brands. Uh, if you can see this, this is a little, um, what looks like an a, um, RV, <laughs> but you can buy that RV and that RV is yours and you can build out whatever you want to on it. So uh, if you want to, you can go and build out your home and then have your virtual mobile home out here in the metaverse too. And I think that that's pretty cool uh, as well. So um, I don't want my screen to freeze, so we're going to stop now. Uh, but definitely, um, you know, we have some really cool things that are happening in this space. And so every week I will be sharing things with you that are happening because they happen um, very rapidly in this space. And the final article that I have to share today is that the U.S. Army, not Meta, is building the metaverse. And so this article takes a, a great look at kind of the history of the army and um, synthetic training environments that they've had since let's say 2017 and a lot of um, the commercial uses that they are they are using the metaverse for. And so, you know, we think about this as something that is um, sequestered to this group of people uh, that are, you know, you know, we're all high tech folks that are thinking about the metaverse, but man, the metaverse, NFTs, Web3, the blockchain. There is not an industry that cannot benefit from what is, is out here. And so when you think about all of these things and you think about them collectively, you are able to really change some of the things that have happened for the better, for the future. And that is what the metaverse is all about. So um, I want to uh, thank all of our sponsors. Um, and I, I want to um, ask that if you appreciated this, this content today, that you please do go ahead and um, and uh, tell us a little bit uh, and then also reach out to us um, and just let me know how you like the show. Uh, you can hit me up on Twitter. Uh, you can hit me up um, at I am technical. Um, and then you can also um, 
uh, reach out to me at uh, info at technical.com. I want to, again, thank our sponsors. And I'm just going to do, 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 move me out of the way <laughs> so that we can thank our sponsors. All right, here we go. All right, so we thank um, Black Multiverse Enterprises. Uh, we thank um, Black Verse, the Metaverse community. We definitely thank Technical Consulting, and we for sure thank the Black Business Network, along with all of our networks that we are broadcasting on, including Pod TV. So um, thank you guys, and I appreciate all of you for being here. I definitely want to also. Um, just say thank you uh, to, to everybody who has tuned in or everyone who's going to tune in and watch this on replays on any of our networks or stations. And um, I also want to make everyone aware that Blackverse is having a Metaverse Summit. And so that Blackverse Summit is happening September 15th through the 16th. You can search for Blackverse Summit on Eventbrite. And uh, you'll be able to uh, buy your tickets. They are $50 right now. That price goes up to $75 on August 15th. So don't miss out. Uh, get your tickets now because we're talking about the power of decentralization. And you're going to hear from people from all up and down the blockchain, all up and down Web3, and the folks who are heading into the metaverse. And yes, this is a virtual conference that will, much of it will be happening in the metaverse. So um, I am, uh, again, happy to be your hostess. Uh, next week, uh, tap in because hopefully we will be talking to some folks about uh, fashion wearables. And then on the 16th of August, we have Naja Roberts, the one and only crypto queen coming to us uh, directly to tell us all about uh, what it means to be self-sovereign. So uh, stay tuned, stay connected, and uh, thank you to all of our production staff behind the scenes who are making things happen for us. And uh, I appreciate you. Have a good day. Have a good future. This is Nicole and my voice is resting. Thank you.